Good morning. Good to see everyone out with us this morning. It's a good day for the Lord to come back, I'll tell you. Uh, Miss McFalls has a couple of announcements. Come on up, sister. Okay, I need to announce that next Saturday is our fall festival. And uh, our theme this year is under the big top. And so we've rented some tents and we've got some games and stuff. We've got, um, we got fishing and we've got um, a, a beanbag toss for the little ones. We also have um, holes to go. So we'll have a putt-putt course here for them to play. Um, the festivities and all that starts at 2 o'clock. It'll run 2 to 5. Our concessions will open at 3 o'clock. Uh, we will have the chili cook-off from 2 to 3. And uh, if you're going to be entered, uh, we have top prizes. There's no cost for anything. Anything that we're doing, there's no cost. So the, uh, the chili cook-off will actually be nominated by those people. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's three. Uh, it's a $50, a $25, and a $15, first, second, and third prize. And what they'll do, they'll bring their chili, and if you're here between two and three, how many uh, contestant, contestants we have on the cook-off will be how many tickets, say there's six, just for ex example, then you'll be given six tickets. You can put them, you can get a taste of their chili, one taste, and uh, then you can decide do I want all my tickets in this one pot, or do I want uh, to try each one and give a ticket to each one? And so the one that has the most tickets will be the first place and second, third, like that. And so the re remaining chili that's left will be given out at the uh, during the concessions. That's why the concessions does not open up till three o'clock. So far, I only have two contestants, so they'll win all the money. So if we need you to volunteer to bring chili to be a part of that. We also have a cakewalk, and I need volunteers to bring things for the cakewalk. It can be individual things like cupcakes or two or three cupcakes. It doesn't have to be a whole lot of stuff, but if you'll bring that to do the cakewalk. Uh, we have a basketball game uh, also to play. We have cornhole. They'll have a lot of festivities. Uh, it'll be done a little different. Uh, we will have chili and tamale, which is like called a full house. And then all the uh, extras that come with that, the cheese and all of that that goes with that. So, like I said, we're going to have popcorn, we're going to have uh, cotton candy, and everybody's invited and they can bring their children, their grandchildren, and we just want, uh, the, want you to know that you're invited and it, it'll be held here at the church. So if you have any questions or you want to sign up for Chili, then there's a form in the back that you can sign up as you go out. And just give it to me by Wednesday so that we have those uh, Chili, uh, whoever. And we won't put their names on who's doing the Chili. It'll just have, uh, on the form, it just has the name of the Chili and the spiciness of it. Okay? So if you have any questions, let me know. And uh, today is also teacher appreciation and the preacher might talk a little bit more of that we appreciate all our teachers our windy night teachers and are thankful for all that they do in jesus thank you sounds like a good time folks you need to sign up for that come be with us um brother keith tkl would you lead us in prayer please <clears throat>
Amen. Today is the day of salvation, folks. Now is the accepted time. Amen. If you would stand and get your All-American Church hymnal, turn to page number 392. There is a fountain filled with blood.
Amen. Lord bless you. Amen. Folks, good to be here. We'd like to welcome every one of you this morning. If you're with us first time, we'd like you to raise your hand and we'll give you a card and let you fill it out. All right, some folks here, folks there, folks over here. Anybody else first time? Someone in the back I see. All right, these folks right here in the middle. We'll make sure you get a card. We want you to know you're welcome. We're glad to have you here today at Temple. Amen. We love our visitors. Sometimes they travel afar off to get here and they come to hear the word of God. Where are you from here in the front, brother? Knoxville. Knoxville. You didn't travel too far, man. <laughs> but we're glad to have you. <laughs> we're glad to have you. You folks here? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. All, right. All right. Well, good to have you. Oklahoma. All right. And back here? Cleveland? Cleveland? All right. You know they call that the holy city, don't you? You ever hear that? Well, they do. And uh, well, nothing wrong with Cleveland now. I've preached uh, meetings in Cleveland. No, it's good. It's a good town. All right. Now, back in the back here. Somebody? Louisiana. All right. Well, good to have you. Bring any alligators with you when you came up here? <laughs> Left them all down there. All right. Don't blame you. <laughs> Anybody else with us this morning? First time. Somebody's point over here? Yes. California. California. All right. You take it for the furthest away. We're glad to have you, California. My goodness gracious. It's amazing to have people from California. You, sir? Charlotte. Charlotte. All right. Good to have you, Charlotte. All right. Good. Good to have you. All right. How many would rather be here than in intensive care? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. We had a good uh, time with the kids yesterday. Uh, I wasn't with them, but they went over and, and, and uh, opened Sevier County, and they had a good time. They really enjoyed it. And I want you to know, if you, we, I, I've take, I'm, I'm at fault for not mentioning it last Sunday morning. I wish I had, but it slipped my mind. But uh, keep that in mind, and also keep in mind what our sister said about this coming Saturday, about, this, uh, about our fall festival. This is Teacher Appreciation Day. I appreciate all our teachers. Amen. Teaching is the fundamental basis foundation for everything we do. Amen. Commit thou to faithful men should be able to teach others also. Teaching is very important. Very, very, very important. And I want to I wanna do that. I want to mention a special prayer request this morning. Sean Eidelmeyer in Haiti. Uh, uh, Brother Barry, I'm sure he knows a lot about it. He's been down there. He's been doing missionary work in Haiti for a long time. Sean told me in, not, in an email, he said it's getting bad here. He said a gallon of gasoline's $40. In some places, 60, depends on where you get it. Now imagine trying to live in a place like that. So please pray for these people. Pray for them down there in Haiti. All right. Well, God bless you, folks. Okay, brother. Well, even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd like to invite the choir up. We'll be singing out of the church hymnal this morning, page number 115 or 114. I've never been sorry. All that will come sing.
If you would stand again, get your church hymnal, turn to page number 286, The Glory Land Way. seated as the choir comes back. Let's have the ushers come up here. We'll take up the morning offering. <coughs> Sister Schlegel, how's Hannah? Is she doing any better? It's our understanding that she's seeing a chiropractor now and he might help her. young lady's been in pain for some time now folks please pray for her. Hannah Sligel lift her name up for the Lord thank you father you let this old dog come one more time to your house I know where you found me <laughs> I know where you found me and I bless you for it amen. in Jesus name amen
good stuff, folks. Brother John Wright's going to be singing for us this morning. Start out with a few scriptures. Psalm 142, verse 4. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people out there lying on the streets, running around, and most of the people in this world don't care. There are plenty who do, and thank God for them. Bless the Lord for CARM and for Salvation Army and for places, people like that, Franklin Graham, that are reaching down. Psalm 66, verse 16. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. Psalm 49, 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Selah. Psalm 30, verse 3, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Our body is going to die. It's going to go into the ground. But our soul will live eternally in one of two places, in heaven or in hell. And God can deliver that soul. It's born and dead, but it can be made alive. Psalm 86 Verse 5, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Verse 12 and 13, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Psalm 35, 9. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. And Psalm 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul. To bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down. When I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul, for my soul. Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. Ye winged seraphs fly, bear the news, bear the news. Ye winged seraphs fly, bear the news. Ye winged seraphs fly, like comets through the sky. Fill vast eternity with the news, with the news. Fill vast eternity with the news. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. 
to God and to the Lamb I will sing. To God and to the Lamb who is the great I am. While millions join the theme I will sing. I will sing while millions join the theme I will sing and when from death I'm free I'll sing on I'll sing on and when from death I'm free I'll sing on and when from death I'm free I'll sing and joyful be, and through eternity I'll sing on, I'll sing on, and through eternity I'll sing on. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? Well, that was good, amen. <laughs> that was good. All right, if you have the Bible, let's hope you have. You don't go to war without a weapon. Book of Jeremiah, chapter number nine. Jeremiah, chapter number nine. And verse number 23. You've heard me say time and time and time again that this is one of my favorite scriptures. It is, absolutely. The fact of the matter is, for the Old Testament scriptures, it's a very, very... Uh, Scripture that reveals the character and nature of Almighty God. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Bless your holy word now. Amen. You can be seated. And let me be sure of you, assure you this morning, nothing has changed. This is one of those uh, immutable things as God is immutable, the same yesterday, today, and forever, this declaration and understanding that we have of him here changes not. The things that the world holds precious, and that is this, the wise man with his philosophy, the mighty man with his power, and the rich man with his riches. Someone said the other day that America is neither a democracy or a, um, a um, what's it called, governed by law? Public. They say it's a plutarchy. And what's a plutarchy? It is a place that is run by the wealthy, by the enormously wealthy. And I'll guarantee you one thing. America is not headed the way it ought to be. Maybe you can go to the polls and vote, but make sure that you get on your knees and pray. That's the main thing. But the things that the world holds precious, the Apostle John said, love not the world, the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then, of course, what he gave is a New Testament parallel to what you just read. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the things that the world seeks after. This is where they get their satisfaction and their enjoyment. The Bible says in the book of Psalm 145 and verse 8, The Lord is gracious 
and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Now, what I'm preaching this morning is about the character of God. Now, we can talk about the sovereignty of God, and that has its place, no doubt. We can talk about the historicity of the Bible and God's movement throughout history, certainly place that. We can get into New Testament doctrine like the epistles of the Apostle Paul, addressed to the church of God, and that has its place for certain. But this morning, I want to talk to you about the character of God. The Bible said it takes no pleasure, none, in the destruction of the wicked. He would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God joins himself and his heart to humanity. It's a remarkable thing when you think about it. Because as you've had me say in this house many times, many times, many times before, there's no statement in the Bible about God joining himself to an angel in his heart, his feeling, and his soul, but he does a man. In Isaiah chapter 63 and verse nine, it says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and bare them and carried them all the days of old. How can you be more involved than that? How can you pour your heart out to someone any more than that? How can you become more attached to someone? And here's why. Only the man can respond the way God wants him to because only the man has been made in the image of God. You, special. You're unique, and it's the world's job to drag you down to the level of a biological animal. Amen. It wants to take your identity away from you and bring, drag you down to that level. My dear friend, you are not an animal. You're a man or a woman made in the image of God. So the Bible says that his personal personal. And don't you notice something about God with his heart, when his heart begins to move? Because you have a heart. How many have a heart in this house today? I'm not saying a bumping organ, beating organ. I'm talking about a heart. I mean, you still have a living soul. How many, how many are still alive? Because you're living in a generation of dead people. They are totally, completely shut off from the feelings of anyone around them. You're witnessing it in your lifetime. And so the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, he was afflicted in their affliction. And over there in the book of Hosea, God said that Ephraim is given over to her idols. Leave her alone. This came forth from God's anger. His righteousness, his holiness began to speak. But in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 31, his heart now reaches out and begins to speak. Jeremiah 31 verse 20 says, Is Ephraim my dear son? Question mark. He's my son, isn't he? That's what he's saying. Ephraim is my son. Is he a pleasant child? Is he, is he the kind of child that you take pleasure in? He's obedient. He, she's obedient. You love them. He says this. He said, for since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. <laughs> I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. You see this? God is a, is, is, a, is a very complicated being, just like we are, like every last one of us. How many of you have gotten mad and said, no more? And then a little while later, once you calm down and your soul began to speak to you, you could see the fallacy of what you just said. That's right. Why? Because you've been made in the image of God. That's why. That's why. Can a woman, Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Can she? These, 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 this is a question, but it's a rhetorical question because what it means is the answer is obvious. <laughs> you ask the question, but in asking the question, it answers itself. A normal woman would never forget her chucking, sucking child, right? She would never do that. And the Bible said that she should not have compassion. Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. All he has to do is look at that hand. There's my name. Isn't that remarkable? <laughs> look at that other hand. <laughs> Your name is in his hand. Engraven in his hand. How can he forget you? 
since that's there. The Bible said in Luke 15, verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, yes. ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Yes. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe. Yes and put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. The fatted calf means he kept one ready. <laughs> Did you get that? He kept it ready for the time that you come back to him. He kept it waiting for you. It's there not to be eaten for any other reason. But for that fellowship and restoration of fellowship, bring the fatted calf, kill it, let us see to be merry. For this my son was dead. It is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. The Bible said, and he kissed him. In Genesis 33, verse 4, and Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. In that part of the world, a kiss sometimes means far more than it does here. It may mean a restoration of fellowship and also a covenant relationship. It may mean that I'm casting my, tr my, my trust upon you again, that we are embracing and this is, this is as intimate as I can be with you. And so they join together. The father is saying to his son, son, there'll be nothing between us. You're coming home and now you're part of that home again. Not half saved, not half restored. God doesn't halfway do anything. When he does it, he does it completely. Notice it says, bring forth the best robe. In the book of Zechariah, chapter number three and verse 40, answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with chain of raiment. Boy, what does that mean? That means that I do not carry the righteousness of myself. I am carrying or I have been covered by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a Jew was recognized by his robe. When the Samaritan woman said to the Jew at the well, he said, how is it that thou art a Jew? It's not that his skin, his face looked any different from her. It's what he had on that identified him as a Jew. And so it is that what you have on, if you have it on right, if you really understand what it means today, you come into this house humble because you say, Lord God, there is no righteousness but yours. I'll never be good enough and cover you by the righteousness. And when that righteousness is wrapped around you, Satan can't touch it. Amen. Hands off, Amen. devil, get thee hence. And then the Bible says he put a ring on his hand. Genesis 41, 42, and Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, put a gold chain about his neck. A ring on his hand was given by the most powerful man on earth. Why did he give him a ring? Because he put him second to the kingdom. That meant that he had authority. This ring shows people you have authority. And so it is with us. He said, I give you power over the enemy. He said, I give you authority over the devils. Amen. And that word that comes forth from your mouth, if you are a believer, is the same as if it's written down in this book. It's still the word of God and it's going forth. Amen. You can say to the demon, demon, get thee hence. You can say to the Satan, you, ha you don't own me anymore. Get your hands off of me. Leave me alone. Get thee hence, Satan. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I plead the blood covenant against you. And when you plead the blood covenant against Satan, there's nothing stronger. There's nowhere else to go. That's all that has to be done. He's finished. For well, the Bible says in Colossians that God made a show of them openly at the cross at Calvary and the blood covenant was the foundation for all that happened. Then the Bible says this, and shoes on his feet. Now we don't understand what that means in East Tennessee. I doubt if anybody in the country would understand. What do you mean shoes on his feet? What do you mean just put shoes? No, it means far more than just putting shoes on your feet. It has to do with a cultural thing. You see, he was preparing him. In the East, the Middle East, in that area, your shoes are what you walk in to walk on the dirt of this earth. And the shoe can become filthy. Have you ever been to seen uh, Japan? I was in Okinawa. 
And I went into, a, I went into the home of an Okinawan and they made, they made fried rice for me. And I sat on a, on, a, on a rice patty and I ate fried rice. But I took my shoes off before I ever walked into that house because they're dirty, they're filthy. You're carrying the dirt of the world on your shoes. So what do you do? He gave him new shoes. He gave him clean shoes. You see, he didn't have any shoes. 2,000 years ago, at slaves didn't have any shoes. They walked barefoot. And probably to this very day, I mean, all you gotta do is get on YouTube and you'll find an awful lot of places over there right now that they don't have any shoes on. It's an indication of, 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 of being less than someone else, of serving them. And so he put shoes on his feet. It's quite a thing. I was watching television a few years ago and it says the Western world was shocked when an Israeli journalist, Muntazer al Zaidi, and I'm sure I butchered his name, threw his shoes at President George Bush. How many remember that? How many saw that? He said, well, he just threw his shoe at him. There's more to it than that. He threw his shoes at President uh, George Bush while he was having a press conference in Iraq on December 14, 2008. In an Arab society, it is an insult to even show the sole of your shoe to someone. To hit someone with a shoe means that person is regarded as the lowest of the low. <laughs> this journalist was saying to Bush, you are a sorry, low down piece of garbage and I'm gonna let you have it and everybody's gonna know what I think about you and I do. Listen to this. After the first Gulf War, George's father, George Sr., had a mosaic of himself made on the floor of the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad. Now he didn't have it done, they had it done for him. <laughs> so that anyone entering the hotel had to walk with their shoes over his face. <laughs> now what are you saying? Do you understand what's going on here? They're saying you sorry low down piece of garbage. Here's his eye. <laughs> Let him have it, boy. <laughs> so the next time you're in Baghdad, if you walk into a hotel and your picture's down there on the floor, you better be leaving because those folks don't care much for you. This is what happened with the shoe, amen? Yes, the shoe. By throwing one shoe at someone goes way back to the time of David. In Psalm 60, verse number eight, David the warrior had assurance from God he would triumph over his enemies. It says in chapter 60 of Psalm, verse eight, Moab is my wash pot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. See now, you understand what that means now. I will cast my shoe over Moab. They are filthy. It's called God's wash pot. Now there's two countries that came into existence from incest. Moab's one. What's the other one? Exactly. Ammon. Moab and Ammon. And who was Ruth? She was a white she was a Moabitess. How, how, how did she get out of that? She made a simple choice. Your God's going to be my God. Where thou livest, I live. Where thou diest, I die. I'll be you and not, I'll be with you and not leave you. And it's that simple. That's all you got to do with God. You're going to be my God. I'm going to receive you. I'm going to accept you. You're the one that I'm going to trust and believe in. That's it. That's as far as it goes. It's that simple. You don't have to have a PhD in theology to get right with God. Amen. The truth of the matter is, my experience has been the more religion you get, the worse it'll drive you. It'll drive you further from God because it's man-made garbage. The Bible said in John 1, and of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, made him known. And the Bible says, who has also made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Yes. This is why it's so important when you walk into a place like this. Oh, I wish, listen, this, I've been at this a while. You, you, you get on YouTube and you look at some of these wild preachers. You look at it and you watch 30 minutes of them and it's not about a service. It's not about God, it's about them. Yes right in your face, letting you know how they're the authority and that we don't need them and you don't need me. It's God you need. 
I'm privileged to be up here before you this morning. Good night. I'm a messenger and that's all I am. I get so sick of these. Listen, it's so sad. It's so sad. It is because the churches are, are falling for this man garbage where the man becomes the center of everything. I wish somehow or another we could come into this house and I would just, would just assimilate into the walls. And when we came in here, the Holy Ghost would begin to exalt the Lord Jesus. How do we get him exalted in here? How do we lift up the Son of God in this house? Because once you lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit changes immediately. If you have the Holy Spirit moving in a congregation of people, it's not by letter. It's not by law. But by my Spirit, saith the Lord. This is why when you go to church services and you see people get up and begin to move and come to the altar and start praying or they may hug each other, they may make things right where they've been falling out before, it's because the Holy Spirit of God is free to move in that place. God give us that here at Temple. My goodness gracious, it's not about how smart we are and how, and how, and how what is the word? what's a good word for it? How, how charismatic we are and how much draw and how beautiful we are. I passed that a long time ago. Hey man, don't worry about that. <laughs> no, that, one, <laughs> that one's way gone. <laughs> 70 years ago. <laughs> no, it's not about that. What's it about? I must decrease, but he must increase. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen, folks. And I'm happy with it. Amen. I'm happy. I told him right over here before I got up to preach a minute ago. I said, Lord... I am, my life is, my life is fulfilled. I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I'm joyous because I'm a, men, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a messenger. That's what I am. That's all I am. That's all I'll ever be. I get the message out. You deal with the message then once it goes out. Amen. 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 The Bible says, God, that the Satan hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. 1 Corinthians 4, 3. Satan doesn't want you to know something. What's he doesn't want you? What, what does he not want you to know? What's the, what, what is it? What's he hiding? Why would he blind you to something? What's the issue? He doesn't blind you to religion. Religion's his creation. Religion will put a wedge between you and God. I mean, you leave the Baptist church, you can go to the Methodist church, and they all look like you, but they don't, they don't, they don't believe like you. You go to the Presbyterian church and you go back into the covenants and you go back into sovereignty and all that, but they're different. You go to the Roman Catholic church, here's the Catholics. They got liturgy is entirely different. You go off over here to the charismatics, you go to the church of God, churches of Christ. You go to all these places with people that look just like you. So what makes the difference? It's Christ. It's him lifted up and it's him exalted. That's what makes the difference. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So what does Satan blind you to? He blinds you to the person of Christ and the person of God the Father. In plain words, here's what he says. Now listen to this. He said, he hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's a beautiful thing. Notice how beautiful that is. Think about it. How many of you believe a man died on a cross 2,000 years ago? I'm glad you do. That shows you believe the historical account because that is a fact. But when that man died on that cross 2,000 years ago, what was he dying for? How many believe he died for you? Can you believe now, dear friend, that when he died for you, that the Bible says God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin? Can you also believe to this morning that the Almighty is my, he gave me my, 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 what a little brain I got. He gave it to me. So he's a lot smarter than I am. How many agree with that? <laughs> a whole lot smarter. So when the Bible said my, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that means that there is a mystery involved in that that is beyond human comprehension, that it has to be a revelation from God. And when God takes me by the Holy Spirit and lets me look at all that, I have to stand back and say, that's beautiful. That's glorious. Because here he is suffering and dying in my place. However much I understand of it, thanks be unto God. Do I understand all of it? No, I don't. Because it's too wonderful to understand all of it. It's the glorious gospel of Christ. Have you had anybody ever stab you at the back? Your good friend put a knife to you. Raise your hand. 
Don't name them. We don't need names in here today. <laughs> but you had a knife put to you. How many of you put your trust in somebody to get something done and they failed you? Completely. How many of you thought you had somebody figured out and come to find out you didn't have them figured out? How many of you ever been around somebody that you got this strange feeling that all the time you were around them, they were slick with their words and they knew how to manipulate you. And the only reason they were around you is so they could get what they could get from you. I'm a flyer, man. We got a bunch of people in here who's had to put to them then. Right? Right. You know why I say that, dear friend? He'll never do you like that. He'll never do you like that. And some of you are broken. Your spirit's broken. Your life's broken. Your marriage is broken. Your family's broken. You've even lost children to this fentanyl. What the monster was that brought that stuff into this country. You've been hurt. You're, hard, you're crying. You're sorrowing. You may be mad at God right now. You may have lost your trust in God. You may feel like that there's, there's an insurmountable uh, uh, wall or there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's some kind of a distance so, that separates you from God that you could never cross that. Great gulf, as he said. But let me tell you something. You don't have to cross it. He'll cross it. He said, I can't find He don't have to worry about finding it. He'll find you. He'll come to you. He'll speak to your soul. He'll talk to you. And if he tells you he loves you, he loves you. If he tells you I'm going to pull you up out of that pit, he'll pull you up out of that pit. If he says I'll never forsake you, he won't forsake you. Preacher, that almost sounds too good to be true. And when he went to the cross at Calvary, he had your name on his lips. Well, what about all my sin, preacher? Now, don't you think about what I'm fixing to say because this is important. This is important. When the old sinner went up before God, he smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me for being a thief. That's not what he said, is it? There's a difference. If Satan can get you to become very Let's, what's the good word for it? Very, very meticulous. I guess that would be a good one. In examining your life and all the sins in your life, he'll start pointing them out to you because he's the accuser of the brethren. And you'll run down here and you'll confess this one and you'll run down here and you'll confess that one. And by the time you've, you think you've got them all confessed, something else will come up and you'll find something else wrong with you yeah. and you'll be back and forth, back and forth. There'll be no end to it. Why? Because you're not perfect. That's why. God be merciful to me a sinner. That covers it all. That's what it means. It covers every bit of it. It covers the parts that I've forgotten about. It covers the parts I don't know anything about. It covers, the, it covers everything Satan can throw at me when I say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm a sinner from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. The apostle Paul said, no soundness in me whatsoever. Romans chapter number seven, my flesh dwelleth no good thing. No good thing. Flesh I serve the law of sin, but with a mind the law of Christ. What he said. So what do we do, preacher? What do we do? We do a simple thing. A very simple thing. You come to him and you acknowledge that you need him. And that you, you can't, your relationship with him cannot be built upon whether or not you are, you are, you are a scientist in being able to pinpoint and figure out everything that's wrong with you. You simply come and say, Lord, here I am. I cast myself at your feet. I need you now more than anything. You're my life. You're my soul. You're my being. I love you, Lord. Help me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And he will. And he'll walk with you and he'll talk with you. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, will cleanse your walk. Because he's faithful and just to do that. And therefore, you're still a sinner. You're, don't ever let anybody tell you they're not a sinner. You're looking at self-righteousness so thick you could cut it with a knife. Every one of us have sinned. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. If you say you have not sinned, you're calling God a liar. And that's not written just for backslidden people. That's written to all of us. So what does it mean then, preacher? That means walk with him. Talk to him. When you fall, cry out to him. When the old sins come nagging back and eating at you, say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need your help. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. 
Wash me in your precious blood. And you'll be amazed at how that walk will just continue and the joy will rise up in your soul and you will be blessed of Almighty God. Well, Lawson, you may be, but I ain't. The Bible said what he hides, he hides it because it's beautiful. If God be for us, the Bible said in Romans 8, then who can be against us? The Bible said, he that spared not his own son, how shall not he also with him deliver us up, freely give us all things? And for he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That's the nature of God. We all need that, every one of us. And there's not a one of you in this house today and I don't want to be mean, but I just want to be real. <laughs> There's not one of you that would let us plug a camera in and a microphone. And worst of all, plug something in that could read your mind for 24 hours. We'd never see you again. <laughs> You'd be gone, boy. <laughs> Long gone. So what's the point then, preacher? The point is that he makes you know you have to have him. Amen. And I'll close with this one. Amen. This is, I love this because this is reality. How many ever heard of Manasseh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joseph had two sons when he was down in Egypt. Manasseh was one. Who was the other one? Ephraim. Ephraim was the largest tribe of all of Israel. He had two sons. Manasseh became an apostate, <coughs> godless. He continued on with what Solomon started when he brought child sacrifice into the country and, uh, and, 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 and worship of, uh, of, of all the false gods and everything, fertil uh, fertility worship and all the sodomites and all of that. And so the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 33, 11, wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Now watch this, and when he was in affliction, he was the king, Manasseh, when he was in affliction. It takes that to wake some folks up. Yes. When he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And I doubt very seriously if there's a soul sitting in this house today that's even as bad as Manasseh, much less worse. This, he, he became a sorry low-down dog, but God heard him. He heard him. And what happened to him? Well, he got right with God. He started cleaning the place up. That's exactly what he did. The Bible said in Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Psalm 119, 71 Good for me, it was good for me that I've been afflicted. Jeremiah 44 says, they are not humbled even unto this day. He wants to do something for you to help you. Your pride's keeping you away from God. It is. Your pride's come up between you and the Lord this morning. Your pride. What do you care about what people think? Why, why do you let that bother you? Listen, they're, they're going to run you down whether you're right or wrong. If they got a long tongue, it's not going to shorten any while I'm being in this place. There, that's right. <laughs> They're going to do you in either way. So why don't you just come down here and let's talk to the Lord. I'll meet you down here. We can all gather around right here if you want to. And just say, Lord, that preacher preached the truth to me this morning. He has. He's preached the truth to me. And I've been listening to Satan. And Satan has worn me out. And I've been doing the best I know how to do, but every time I try, the harder I try, the worse it gets because he keeps dragging stuff up before me. Yeah. He keeps showing me how imperfect I am, and you are, and so am I. Yeah. So what you need to do is take God at his word. Amen. If you'll come and trust him, he'll cleanse you. <coughs> if you'll come and, and come and, if the Bible said, if you're a broken and trite, a contrite spirit, oh God, I will not despise. Amen. He won't despise a broken and contrite spirit. If you'll come to him, he'll meet you right here. And you can walk out of this house today and you'll have, a, you'll, have, you'll have joy in your step. You'll have victory in your heart. But the main thing is this. You'll learn what it is to walk in fellowship with God. Because a lot of people mean well. They do. But they just don't know how to go on from that. And they'll let Satan beat them to death. Bow your heads for a minute. Father.
I, I delivered my soul. I gave him what you gave me. And I'm sure there's a whole lot more that you could say. But this messenger here, Lord, is I'm done. You're done with me. But you can go on. You can take the birds down, go home with them. You can take them to work next week. You can go right with them, step for step. And I pray in Jesus' name. Might raise your hand tonight, your hand this morning, and say, Preacher Lawson, I want to come down there and pray with you. Come down here and pray with me this morning. We're going to get down here in the altar and we're going to pray. We're going to get a hold of God. We're going to get some joy back in our life. We're going to get some victory back in our life. We're not going to leave out of here the way we came in here. We want to leave out of here with a song in our heart, power in our soul, and we want that joy back. If you've ever had that joy, then my friend, you're miserable without it because you know what I'm talking about. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Let's have us a prayer. Anybody else while we're going to pray now? We're going to pray. You come on down here and let's pray. I'm going to stand up here and pray because I want you all to be able to hear me. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you now. You know where I came from. You know where you found me. Amen. I give you all glory and praise for it, Lord. And Father, for what little bit you've taught me down through the years, you've helped me. You've helped me. And you could probably have taught me a whole lot more if I hadn't been so rebellious and stubborn and didn't want to hear your word and thought I knew it all. But there's so much more to know. Father, I pray this morning for these dear folk who came to this altar. They got down here. They're talking to you. They know the enemy. They know, they, they know the enemy. They're, they're hurt. They've been hurt by the enemy. Some of them are carrying scars right now in their soul from the enemy. Now, some of them this morning, our Heavenly Father, it's, their heart's been filled up with hatred, vengeance, Lord, fear, all the things that you use to destroy a soul. It's, been, it's, it's filled them up. God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that the glory of God, that that glorious gospel of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine to them this morning. And Heavenly Father, they could see the victory that is yours, that Christ paid for all that, that you'll never leave them, you'll never forsake them, you'll never fail them. You'll be there, every, you'll be there as long as that heart beats in this world. Then you'll be there to take them on to glory. Bless them, Heavenly Father. Pour your Holy Spirit out upon these dear folk. God, I'm here the day to help people. That's why I'm in here. And I want to help them, Father. I want you to bless them now. I want you to cleanse them. I want them to feel that cleansing. I want them to know that there's a freedom now that's come into their life. And Lord, the, that'll come. It'll, I know you. <laughs> I know you. The joy will come back to their soul. And you, you can't, you, there's no counterfeit for that joy, Lord. There's no counterfeit for it. And I pray you'd bless them now and cleanse them, forgive them for Jesus' sake, wash them in the precious blood of Christ. If they're not saved, then I pray that you'd save them. If they are saved, that Father, draw them closer to you and fill them with the Holy Ghost. And for those that aren't saved this morning, I, Heavenly Father, when, when we're done here, I pray that we'd know it. Maybe they want to come and tell us. And then we can do what we need to do to lead them to the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. 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 Well, that's the last thing I'll say before we let you go. God's not mad at you. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God does not demand from you what is you're totally incapable of producing. That's why Christ came. He did for you what you could not do for yourself. So therefore your faith and your trust is in the one who did it for you. Not yourself. Don't trust yourself. Put your trust in God. Amen. Stand up this morning. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll let you go. Thank you for listening to me. Holy Ghost was in here. I could tell. He, 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 you were listening. Amen. <laughs> Believe me, I've preached to the walls, the pews, the, the uh, instruments, and uh, never got a thing. Bounce my, 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 my voice bouncing all over the place. Therefore, we preach to people. Amen. They can respond. Brother Bobby Gaylor, God bless you now. Dismiss us this morning.
Father, thank you, uh, thank you so much for feeding my soul this morning. Yes. Thank you so much for teaching and preaching today. Thank you for our guests that travel to come and spend this time. Yes. We pray that they yes. on their journey home. Yes. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Be safe, folks. Be careful now. Meet again 6 o'clock this evening. <laughs>